weekend goes by and we we uh, catch up with each other as going state to state. Okay, so you're planning on being uh, maybe running mates then, or no, no, no. We are not running mates. We are uh, we are opponents. The uh, both of us are trying to uh, earn the nomination, which will. Uh, be granted at the national convention in Atlanta, Georgia, next May. Um, all of the libertarians from around the country will show up in Atlanta. Um, I'm guessing they're going to be in the neighborhood of a thousand delegates. And if that is true, I will need a total of 501 votes in order to become the libertarian nominee. And when that happens, the person who wins the nomination will then. Uh, be the libertarian poster child between May and the election in November. And you got pretty big shoes to fill following up Harry Brown, right? Well, that's uh, that's true. Harry Brown was a excellent speaker. He had, uh, you know, a lot of succinct answers. Um, however, there were people who didn't feel that he had the uh, the passion, uh, you know, that was. Uh, would be required for somebody going for that position. And really? That so surprises I'm hoping, me. I'm hoping to be a uh, far more passionate Harry Brown. Okay, well, he seems plenty charismatic to me, so I guess if you're just going to add charisma on top of that, that'd be all right. Yeah, well, um, not charismatic so much as passionate. Uh, you know, he was an excellent speaker, but, uh, you know, he was uh, fairly... Um, just, just lackluster, I guess, is uh, possibly a word that I would use. I mean, he, he, I loved his answers, um, and as did most libertarians. But um, I think that non-libertarians watching him um, might be unimpressed. And although he may have more eloquent answers than I do, I think that when I stand in front of an audience, uh, it only takes a few minutes for them to realize that I genuinely mean all the things that I say. I, my message, my, my speeches don't come off the top of my head. They come straight from the heart. Do you have any differences on any major issues with Harry Brown? I don't believe so. Again, Just uh, a matter of form, the, basically. Yeah, well, that is true of most libertarian candidates for whatever office they are running for. The Libertarian Party considers itself to be the party of principle. And we have a straightforward series of ideas that all stem from uh, recognition of private property. Now, you have the right to do anything you want with your property as long as you don't you know, damage or destroy my property. And you have, and Libertarians recognize that, you know, that we have no right to access someone else's property for our use. So that is our fundamental principle, and all libertarians believe in that, and we derive our uh, issue positions from that single uh, axiom. And therefore, it's very unusual to find libertarians that uh, differ radically on, on any particular issue. Uh, probably the most widely uh, divisive issue would be the issue of abortion. And there are libertarians on both sides of that issue, uh, primarily because we haven't been able to define uh, when life actually starts to everybody's uh, satisfaction, or as I like to redefine the problem, when does the baby take ownership of its body? You know, your right to life is derived from the assumption that you own your own body. And if someone else owns your body, that makes you a slave. So if it is true that we own our own body, my question is when does the baby take ownership of that body? And so uh, unfortunately that does not solve the problem. It simply redefines it as a non-religious uh, problem. 
Right. And regardless of your personal view on that, if you do become president of the United States, you don't have the slightest bit of jurisdiction over that issue anyway. That's, right? That's true. That's true. However, people still want to know, you know, what my positions are on, on these issues. Um, and I kind of got off the track a little bit. We were talking about the, the differences between libertarians. And because of the fact that we are all centered on the same premise of private property, all libertarians hold very similar views. And I've actually had people come up to me and, and kind of angrily criticize me that all of us libertarians sound alike, as though that were a bad thing. And I consider it a very good thing and a compliment by virtue of the fact that we do hold a a principled position, and unlike the Democrats or the Republicans, when you are voting for a Libertarian, you, you are fairly certain of the type of politician that you are likely to get, even though you don't know their background. With Democrats and Republicans, you can be a pro-gun or anti-gun Democrat. You can be a pro-gun or anti-gun Republican. So simply by virtue of the uh, person's political affiliation, you have no idea where they stand on the Second Amendment. When you vote for a libertarian, you can be guaranteed that that libertarian candidate strongly supports the Bill of Rights and Second Amendment in particular. With no exceptions. With no exceptions. Uh, and I know that for a fact because... The Libertarian Party has a, a different nominating process than most of the uh, than the other two parties. Within the Libertarian Party, members of the Libertarian Party always have an opportunity to vote for none of the above. So, if you have two or three scoundrels who want the job, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you have you are limited to accepting one of those scoundrels. Within the Libertarian Party, we have the opportunity to vote for none of the above, thereby leaving that office empty. And we are not forced to have somebody representing our party who does not support our particular ideals. And during my very first election in Austin, I was running for state representative in District 47, we had a uh, Travis County convention, and a young college boy from the University of Texas was running for a similar office. And no one knew him. We were asking him, you know, how well he supports the Libertarian platform. And his answer was that he supported all of the Libertarian platform except our position on the Second Amendment. He is feeling, uh, in as much as he came from uh, China, was that only the government had the authority to um, control you know, rifles and pistols. And while it is perfectly understandable why he held that particular point of view, we voted for none of the above and chose not to allow him to represent us on the ballot. So the, uh, it seems like party, it, it should have been a simple matter of explaining it to them that this ain't China. And the reason China yep. is China is because the people over there don't own guns. And, and the problem with that is that you and I hold that feeling so strongly that it does appear to be self-evident or obvious. However, as an instructor, I know that there is no such thing as obvious. Information is only obvious after you've had an opportunity to learn it. For example, a baby does not know that a stove is hot. That is not obvious until after the first time you put your hand on the stove and burn yourself. I learned that one the hard way. I think all of us did at some point in our early lives. And so as adults, we may take it for granted, we may consider it obvious the stove is hot, but that information is not true. I mean, there's nothing obvious. And while we may hold that, you know, the right to keep and bear arms is an obvious right, 
protected by the Second Amendment, other people have not learned that. And it is not obvious to them. To them, it is equally apparent that only the government should be allowed to control weapons of force. They have not learned that if the government controls the weapons of force, very soon they will be the only organization to control the weapons of force. And then you end up with a government similar to China and Russia and all of the other dictatorial countries. And by the way, well, I guess I should try to figure out how to phrase this in the form of a question, but the right to bear arms in America existed before the Second Amendment was ever written, correct? Well, all of your rights precede the Constitution. One of the things that I do as I campaign around the country is to try to remind people or teach them for the first time, if necessary, that their rights do not come from the Bill of Rights. The Constitution does not grant you any rights. That's because rights and privileges are opposites. A right is something that you can do without asking. A privilege is something that someone of a higher authority allows you to do. And so being opposites, they are like black and white, true and false, rights and privileges. They are opposites. And so if I have a right to keep in their arms, then I do not require a concealed carry permit. That's an oxymoron. It, it's not possible for the government to issue you permission in order for you to exercise the right. If that were true, we would all be filling out government forms that allow us to go to church on Sunday and would permit us to exercise our respective religions. No such government form exists because we all recognize freedom of religion as a right. Well, the Second Amendment works the same way. I know that there are people who would be nervous if I were carrying a gun. They would toss and turn all night, and it would just make them feel very, very uneasy. Well, I really don't care. My right to keep and bear arms is not predicated on whether or not someone else feels good about it. My rights are not granted to me based on the surrounding population, you know, feeling good about whether or not I'm carrying it. Now, we in Texas take great pride in our support of the Second Amendment. However, I recently returned from a uh, seminar in New Hampshire, and I'm very pleased to report that during our little barbecue picnic that evening, there were no less than five people openly carrying pistols and holsters. Nobody got all weirded out. Nobody was, you know, shrieking and calling for the police. You know, they would just simply lean over the table, ask you to pass the mustard. And, and nobody was a, starting trouble that day. And, and nobody was starting trouble. And those were just the five pistols that I was able to see out in the open. I strongly suspect that there were at least another five people who had, you know, weapons concealed, either under a jacket or in their purse or in a nearby car. And everybody in New Hampshire is very, very friendly. They are very hospitable. And I am just very, very pleased that I was able to participate in that picnic and to see people exercising their God-given right. Okay, well, since you're a presidential candidate, I ought to ask you what makes you better on the gun issue than George W. Bush, because TV said that he was right in the pocket of the gun lobby. Well, being in the pocket of the gun lobby implies that his opinion can be swayed. And personally, I don't think that the gun lobby is doing very much to protect my rights. I think that organizations such as the NRA, which had a, a viable function originally, are actually whittling away my Second Amendment rights a little bit at a time by proposing rational gun laws or making sure that gun laws are not passed too rapidly. But they, they are, in effect, allowing the government to infringe on my Second Amendment rights. 
and I am not in anybody's pocket. There's nobody paying me money. Nobody influences my opinion, not even the Libertarian Party. As far as I am concerned, 20,000-plus gun laws in the United States are unconstitutional, period. End of story. Any, any law which presumes to limit your ability to protect yourself is in direct violation of the Constitution, as and as Marbury versus Madison so eloquently stated, is repugnant to the Constitution. Okay, so if you were president, would you then propose to Congress that they start repealing all 20,000 of these, or at least all the federal gun laws? Absolutely. Um, and as the chief executive, I have the authority to write executive orders. Now, when I teach my eight-hour Constitution class, I let people know most of the executive orders that have been written are invalid because prior to the United States, the King of England would simply sign a proclamation and make it law. Okay? The, the people of England never got an opportunity to vote on it, and the king was allowed to do that because he was the king. We moved to the North American continent, and we created a better form of government. Our form of government has a system of checks and balances wherein the legislative branch writes the law, and the executive branch merely enforces the law. If that is true, how can a president of the United States sign an executive order and presume to make law for 285 million Americans without any intervention with Congress? Doesn't that bypass the system of checks and balances? The Constitution begins with all legislative powers shall reside in the Congress. That's right. And by writing an executive order and pretending that it applies to citizens of the United States, the uh, President of the United States is violating his oath of office. Now, a proper uh, executive order would be written by the Chief Executive or the President to the subordinate executives, all the people that work for the president in the executive branch. I could constitutionally write an executive order telling all of my executive branches, such as the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms branch, that they are not permitted to deprive citizens of the United States of their weapons for any reason unless they are in the actual action of committing murder or robbing a bank or using that uh, weapon to violate someone else's right. What if, but, they're, what if they're convicted felons? My position is that we put convicted, we put felons in jail for various lengths of time so they can pay their debt to society. After they have paid their debt to society, we would let them out of prison. Now, once you leave, if you leave a restaurant and leave money on the table, you have paid your debt to the restaurant. The restaurant doesn't continually send you a bill every other week asking for additional money. So, all of the people who are in jail are in jail for a reason. And while they are in jail, they should not be allowed to carry money. However, once they have been released from jail, they have, quote, paid their debt to society, and they should have all of their rights restored. If we don't trust them on the outside, keep them in jail. Okay, now, now, when, now when you say that, uh, I, I agree with you on that. I think that you made, you made that point well. But when you say that you could order, if, if elected president, you could order ATF to no longer deprive people of their right to bear arms and that kind of thing, doesn't the Constitution require that you faithfully execute the law? And isn't does the president have the authority to decide which laws he wants to enforce and which ones he doesn't? No. No, I mean, the, the, the president does make those decisions. However, Marbury versus Madison indicated that any law repugnant to the Constitution is null and void. It's not a law. So, for example, when you well, go but, to wait, the Pardon me, pardon me. Didn't Marbury versus Madison also establish that it was up to the Supreme Court to decide what was constitutional, not the president? Well, the 
uh, Or was that McCall Court. versus Maryland? I forget. Well, the, I believe that uh, Marbury versus Madison, uh, it, it was either, uh, I think it was Marbury versus Madison. However, let's keep in mind that the Constitution did not allocate that power to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court assumed that responsibility on their own. And that decision all by itself is unconstitutional because the Constitution, by its construction, puts limitations on the various branches of government. And no branch of the government, including the Supreme Court, can exercise authority outside the Constitution. They can't say, oh gosh, we're going to do this. If the Supreme Court wants to uh, be the interpreter of the Constitution, then we need to either amend the Constitution, or I would prefer setting up a federal grand jury of, you know, maybe 30 or 40 Americans taken at random from various parts of the country that would make those decisions. We don't we don't allow lower judges to make the final decision. Anybody who is familiar with the fully informed jury association understands that the jury, we the people, make the final decision as to what is or is not against the law. Although that is not practiced normally in our statutory courts these days. Why don't you explain normally, that? Explain that a little bit more. What the difference between the way the jury, the power of the jury now, and the power of the jury originally in this country? Okay, that's it, quite it, a distinction. It, I think that the, the different things that are up to the jury to decide, right? And that's true. And and the problem, one of the reasons that the United States has as many problems as it does is that Americans do not understand our form of government. They have not been taught the Constitution. They have never read the Bill of Rights, and they simply believe whatever people in authority tell them. And so when the judge says to the jury, you are allowed to decide the facts of the case, but because I'm wearing the black robe and because I'm the judge, I have all the authority to determine the law. And most people are unfamiliar with the law, and so they believe that story. And it turns out that story is a lie. The very first Supreme Court hearing, we had uh, the Supreme Court Justice was John Jay, one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. And John Jay gave instructions to the jury, indicating that even though he was a judge, and even though he was more learned in the law, it was the jury's responsibility to decide not only the facts of the case, but also to decide the law. And since that time, the court system has been corrupted by judges and lawyers willing to distort the information and by an uneducated public that doesn't know the truth and we have allowed our court system, because I won't even call it a judicial system, to be totally warped out of shape. The court system is one of the greatest violators of our series of rights. So, going back to something I was beginning to say earlier, if you go to the grocery store and you see the National Enquirer, and the headlines of the National Enquirer say, Woman gives birth to Martian baby. Should we start running around looking for extraterrestrials? I mean, it was in black and white. Would the National Enquirer imprint it if it weren't the truth? Well, everybody who grows up learns or is told that you're not supposed to believe everything that you read. If I hand you a really nice certificate with a gold scroll around the edge and a nice seal and ribbon at the bottom signed by all sorts of famous people, and it's the document says that you are now the proud owner of the Golden Gate Bridge. Can you go out to the Golden Gate Bridge and start collecting tolls as people drive across? I know I couldn't, but I know that people have tried before. Okay. I heard about a guy who sold the Eiffel Tower seven different times for scrap. Okay. Now, the point that I'm trying to make to people 
is that simply because something is written on paper, simply because it looks official, does not make it true. People need to engage their brain and think. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, all other laws notwithstanding. That means if somebody comes up with a law that pretends to authorize slavery, that is not a law. I don't care if it's on paper. I don't care how many people believe it. It is not a law because it violates the Constitution. It violates the spirit of property wherein people own their own body. Any law which presumes or pretends to be a gun law violates the Second Amendment. And I don't care how many pieces of paper you've got it written on. I don't care how many people believe that it's a law. It violates the Constitution, and it is null and void. And as the chief executive, I will not enforce any presumed law, and I will write an executive order, basically an inner office memo to all of the people in the executive branch who legally work for me. And I will warn them that if they violate the constitutionally protected rights of my citizens, that it will be my responsibility not only to fire them, but to also file an indictment against them and make sure that they go to jail. Because everybody who works for the government takes an oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution. Now, they are not trying to protect the piece of paper to make sure that we don't get additional ink smudges on it. When we say that someone is protecting the Constitution, what we really mean is they have taken an oath. They have bound themselves legally to this political trust, and they have assumed the responsibility of protecting the rights and property of the citizens of the state. They now have a fiduciary responsibility to protect those rights. And every government agent who has taken that oath, who subsequently violates that oath, has lied under oath. That is, at the very least, perjury. Boy, are you going to have problems with the federal government employee unions. I don't think they're going to like you at all, man. I don't care whether they like me. You okay, know, pardon me. i, I got to ask you a couple of questions about uh, two things that you just brought up. Okay. Uh, first of all, when you say slavery unconstitutional, you're referring to the 13th Amendment or the Constitution as written by the slave owners who wrote it? I, I would say that it was uh, unconstitutional based on the slave owners who wrote it. The basic purpose of the Constitution is to protect your property. I mean, that, that's what it's all about is property. And the idea of property was so important that Samuel, or not Samuel, excuse me, John Adams, the President of the United States immediately following George Washington, said, quote, the moment that it is admitted into society that the uh, law of property is not as sacred as the law of God and that there is not a force of justice and uh, force of law and public justice to protect it, then tyranny and anarchy commence. Well, but that's how they justified so, slavery, right? Was by saying that the, those human beings were their property. That is true. That is true. And if you read the Constitution carefully, you'll note that although the Constitution did not eliminate slavery, it did deal slavery a death blow because slavery was not going to be permitted for any more than another 20 years or something like that. I don't, I don't remember that clause as well as I remember others. Actually, yes, but, it was uh, Thomas Jefferson took office on, on uh, the very day that the 20 years was up, and the ver- his very first order of business was to propose to Congress a law to ban the importation of slaves. Okay. Now... You know, there are a lot of people who, you know, criticize Thomas Jefferson in particular and many of the other founding fathers in general for having slaves. 
And I think this is disingenuous. I mean, it's very easy for us to look back 230 years later and say, well, gosh, this is obviously the answer. However, we are not living in the late 1700s. We don't have all of this um, personal history to overcome. And I think that the Founding Fathers were doing everything that they could to eliminate slavery. In fact, the Declaration of Independence, the original draft of the uh, Declaration of Independence, mentioned slavery more than once. However, the southern states found exception with that. It was rather embarrassing to be criticizing the king for slavery when the southern states were participating in that same act. And Thomas Jefferson was heartbroken because the, uh, the Congress, Continental Congress, modified and reduced the size of the uh, Declaration of Independence uh, in part by removing the references to slavery. And I think that we need to keep in mind that Thomas Jefferson treated his slaves much better than the average uh, plantation owner. And we also need to keep in mind that most of his slaves were acquired when his wife Martha's father passed away. Martha's father was a much larger slave owner, and when he passed away, it was the custom of the time for his daughter's husband to acquire all the property because women didn't, you know, were not allowed to own property. So once Thomas Jefferson had all those slaves, what was he going to do with them? Let's presume, just for the moment, that Thomas Jefferson did free all of his slaves. Where were they going to go? I mean, if they were to leave the property, if they were to walk off of Thomas Jefferson's property, they would have been quickly taken up by someone else and captured and used as slaves by someone else. Someone more likely to abuse them and beat them than Thomas Jefferson did. So... I think that it's disingenuous, disingenuous of us to look back and to berate the Founding Fathers for not eliminating slavery completely when in 1963 and 64, while I was still 10 years old, we were still, still ripping black people to drink from own separate uh, drinking fountains and to eat in their very own restaurants. I mean, Rose Parks sat at the front of the bus and removed, refused to move to the back of the bus in my lifetime. And so for us to accuse the Founding Fathers of not eliminating slavery completely when we were still exercising racial discrimination in the lifetime, I, I think that is even more hypocritical than these people are accusing the Founding Fathers of being. Something else you brought up there was the issue of sovereign immunity and how if any, if you were the president and any of your executive officers violated anyone's natural rights or the Bill of Rights, that you would prosecute them. And I was under the impression that uh, if you commit a crime while you're on the clock working for the federal government, that you're immune from all prosecution. Well, that's an interesting theory, isn't it? I say it all the time. I know that you hear it all the time, and it's a nice little backup plan that, you know, agents of the federal government use to deny them any uh, repercussions from their actions. So either these people who take an oath of office are required to protect our rights, or they're not. It can't be both ways. If they are required to protect our rights, then there must be some sort of consequence for those people who violate our rights. If there is no consequence for violation of our rights, such as the idea of sovereign immunity, then why bother having the Constitution? Because anybody who works for the federal government can do anything that they want to anyone because they have sovereign immunity. It cannot be both ways. 
How did it get this way? It wasn't like this in the days of John Jay and Thomas Jefferson, was it? No, absolutely not. And the way that it got this way is through ignorance. Nobody will willingly give up their rights. However, because of 50 years of government control of our schools, people no longer learn about the Constitution. People do not know the difference between rights and privileges, and they don't know the prop role of government. And so if you don't know what the government is supposed to do, when you've got a bunch of goons come in with uh, black hoods and bulletproof vests, then, you know, you don't know that this is uh, a violation of the Constitution. Now, instinctively, you're pretty sure you don't like it, you're pretty sure that, you know, you would rather they not be kicking down your door in the middle of the night. But if you don't know the Constitution, you have no way to legally defend yourself against such actions because, my gosh, these guys must have sovereign immunity. So as far as I am concerned, there is no such thing as sovereign immunity. Anybody who takes an oath of office becomes a public servant. They work for the people. And they cannot be uniformly protected from their actions. This is Philip Drew. You're listening to an interview with Michael Bednarik. He's running for president as the libertarian. Let's talk about foreign policy, sir. What should be the foreign policy of the United States? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. What should be the foreign policy of the United States? In general and specifics, too, if you like. The, um, for those people who take the time to read George Washington's farewell address as he finally left the White House, he was cautioning us to establish uh, economic ties with all nations and entangling alliances with none. In other words, he felt very strongly that the United States should keep its nose out of other countries' business. Now, the Libertarian Party believes in, you know, individual rights and personal responsibility. You have a right to your property, but you're supposed to keep your nose out of my business. That's the way we um, approach things on a personal level, and naturally this expands up to the national level. If you think of the United States as, you know, one entity, we have no constitutional authority to be going in to other countries, telling them what to do with their property and how to run their lives. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Well, and for the last... Un- the current administration we- says it's our responsibility, it's our moral responsibility to make a safe, a safe world in that... In fact, I interviewed a guy on the 4th of July from the Veterans for Peace who said that, uh, you know, the Founding Fathers had the luxury of legitimate isolation and that we don't have that anymore, that the world's gotten much smaller and we're so interdependent with the rest of the world that we must take responsible, proactive foreign policy to maintain peace throughout the world. Well, that's... (laughs) I gotta be careful of my this, language. This guy I, was I, not a Republican I, justifying George I, Bush. He was talking about the alternative to George Bush, he thought, at least. I, I understand. And and you know, I don't know who that person was, and with all due respect, I vehemently disagree. The purpose of the Constitution and the American government is to protect the rights and property of American people, period. It has no responsibility and no authority to be traveling to other countries. The United States government is sanctioned with the responsibility of national defense. What we currently have right now is international offense. We have military uh, presence in over 130 countries around the world, and we are basically telling these other countries how they should run their countries, how they should live their lives, And surprise, surprise, they're a little bit, you know, irritated by that. Imagine how we would feel if Canada sent a bunch of Mounties down into Texas and told us how we should live our lives and try to take our guns away from us. Imagine how we would feel if 
uh, the Mexicans sent uh, advisors, you know, into California to tell us how we should run our health care system. You know, the Americans wouldn't take, you know, very kindly to that. And, you know, the golden rule that we were taught when we were young is to treat others the way we would like to be treated. And so if we go into all these other countries telling them how things should be there, imagine what type of argument we're going to have when the United Nations comes to the United States and tells us how to run our lives. Do you think that we're at risk of that happening? I, I don't think that we are just at risk. I think that it is beginning to happen. That the current, uh, the, the most recent uh, administrations have been sacrificing our national sovereignty to the United Nations. Most of the money and funding for the United Nations comes from the United States. We pay anywhere, I think it's approximately 60% of the funding for the United Nations, and it gives all of these other countries, theoretically gives these other countries, a vote in how life is being lived in the United States. And I don't think that there are anybody in the United States who wants to be a United Nations citizen. Well, maybe a, now, little, maybe a few people on the East Coast. The, the point is that our, it is precisely our foreign policy over the last hundred years where we have gone around empire building, essentially, and interfering with the lives of, and uh, policies of other countries which has caused other countries to dislike us as much as they do. It causes those countries to set up terrorists and come here to blow up our buildings. And so if I ever become the president, one of the first things that I will do will be to bring our troops home. You know, I want to take our soldiers out of harm's way. How do you undo the past policies that... I mean, these people, as you say, we're, we've built all this hatred around the world. Bringing the troops home isn't going to eliminate that hatred, at least not right away. Well, I, I, can't, I can't promise to solve problems right away. As I said, it's taken, you know, over 100 years to create these problems. You know, when you, when you realize that you're fat and you start going on an exercise plan, you can't expect to drop 50 pounds the first day. So, you know, my plan is to set up, set the United States on a course to where we can establish peace throughout the world. And you're certainly not going to establish peace by sending soldiers all over the place with guns and cannons and rockets. I mean, that's, that's ludicrous. So the bringing way, all the troops home is a good first step. Bringing the troops home is a good first step, and also we can increase our economy by allowing our companies to sell products in other countries. If we are selling food and telephones and television sets and other commodities which raise the standard of living in these other countries, do you think that they are going to bite the hand that's feeding them? You know, A, we won't be there with our military telling them what to do, and B, we are giving them things that they need to survive. They are not likely to come here and blow up buildings in the United States. And this is exactly what George Washington was talking about. We need to have economic ties with all countries and entangling alliances with none. We should not be telling any other country how to live their lives. And the sooner we bring our uh, soldiers back home, the more, uh, the less likely we will be to uh, incur the wrath of all of these, uh, these other countries. Well, Donald Rumsfeld's begun pulling our troops out of South Korea. What do you make of that? I hadn't heard that. Um, and... You know, I, at first glance, I would say that that would be a good step. However, I, I'm not uh, privileged to the information that the State Department collects, so I, I'm not willing to say that, uh, you know, this is an honorable 
first step to something greater. You know, I it's more like I that he's clearing a, the way for war rather than trying to defuse the situation. Yeah, I mean that again. I don't know uh, what information the State Department has, and I don't know what Donald Rumsfeld's uh, motivations are. I am disinclined to believe that. Uh, you know, they are honorable or uh, directed towards peace. I need to ask you about the borders. It's a very contentious issue. Most libertarians, I think, say, hey, individuals are individuals, and of course, if you got to have free trade and capital, you got to have free trade in human beings, too, and let everybody go where they want. At the same time, there's a, another faction of the libertarians who are uh, very for clamping down on uh, the southern border, especially. Um, and basically calling it an invasion and saying it's in the interest of our national security that we must close that border. So I'd like to know whether your point of view is either of those or something different. Well, this is one of those questions which, you know, is usually half of a question. It's very similar to what's the difference between a tree? And and those questions are hard to ask. You have to look at a bigger picture. Sorry. The, board, the borders, the people coming... Uh, up from Mexico, are, that's not the only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is our welfare system, which is, you know, growing out of control. And if you, if you allow me to take both of those problems together as opposite sides of the same coin, then it's a much easier question to answer. The reason that people are angry about uh, the influx of Mexicans over the border is not because they have some, uh, you know, prejudice against the Mexican people. What they are concerned about, if they were honest with themselves, is the the fact that a lot there it is their impression that these Mexicans are coming into the country and getting free medical care, free education, free transportation. I mean, basically. They walk across the border and immediately start, uh, um, you know, taking up money from the welfare rolls. And, you know, I do not want to pay for anyone else's education or hospitalization or housing, regardless of what nationality they come from. So I think that if we eliminate the welfare system altogether for anybody, and which is basically just socialism, by the way, um, if we were to eliminate that, then I don't think that it would be re a, as big a requirement to... Um, we, we, first of all, we certainly cannot build a 20-foot wall all along our southern border and still hope to uh, keep people out. And it's like trying to keep the sun from rising in the morning. Some way, somehow, you know, people will devise a way around it. Instead of making the wall taller, what we should do is lower the requirements so that they are easy for people to achieve and simply say, look, you're welcome to come into this country. All we want you to do is stop by at this office, fill out this paperwork, let us take your picture, just so we know who you are. The people who are coming here are generally coming here to get a better life for themselves, and they are doing work that most Americans would never dream of doing. I used to live in California, and I would travel to these little towns out in the uh, central California where the migrant workers would work all day in the hot sun picking, you know, lettuce or whatever the produce was. You know, and they would do so at incredibly, insanely low salaries. You or I would we would rather deliver papers than take a, a job where we'd have to work that hard. I also want to remind people that during the late 1800s and early 1900s, we had a huge influx of citizens coming from Europe. We had the Italians, the Germans, the Polish, the, the Jews, every nationality that had the opportunity. They were coming over the Atlantic Ocean in boats, um, eventually, they set up Ellis Island, just uh, not far from the Statue of Liberty, to monitor all these people coming in. And, and many of them stayed in New York 
which is why New York City is the uh, largest city in the United States. But they would come through all of the, the big towns, Chicago and Los Angeles, well, yeah, I guess to Los Angeles as well. And it, the reason that they came here, basically with the clothes on their back, is because they were trying to pursue the American dream. All you have to do is come to America and work really, really hard, and you too can own your own business, own your own home. But you have to work really hard, and they were willing to do that. And it was that all that back-breaking work performed by all these immigrants to our country, which made the United States the, the superpower that it is. It raised not only the standard of living in the United States, but the standard of living around the world. And for us to turn around and say suddenly that, you know, well, we're not going to let these people in because, you know, we don't like something about them is, is prejudicial. And if we remember the quotation on the base of the Statue of Liberty that, you know, it says, give us, give me your tired, your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to be free. It doesn't say send us all your rich people and all their money. So if we are to truly believe and support the spirit of liberty, I think that we do need to uh, welcome people into the United States because we are a beacon of freedom. As bad as it may be in the United States right now, we are still, you know, head and shoulders above the uh, living conditions in any other country in the world. So to sum up quickly, you're, the solution to the problem with, of illegal immigration is to get rid of all the socialism and to let them all come in legally so that they don't have to come in illegally. That's true. You know, if we, can, if we allow them to come in legally, that, then it will be easier for us to know where they are, what they're doing, and that uh, you know, they will be contributing to our society rather than the image that it, they, people have right now of all these people coming across and just draining everything away from our society. And it's going to take a while for us to change that mental image. Even if I could make it true overnight, there are still going to be Americans who hold at some level of prejudice. And those, that level of prejudice is not going to go away overnight. Well, they just need to be taught individualism, and then they won't see anybody as a group anymore. That's right. That's absolutely correct. All right, everybody, you're listening to the Philip Drew interview show with Michael Badnarik. He's running for president as the Libertarian. Our hour's almost up, but I don't have another interview next hour, and I've got plenty more questions if you'd like to stay on. I know you're on C-SPAN at 5.30. Um, I, I can stay for, uh, oh, maybe another half hour or so, just short of that. Okay, great. And, by the way, everybody, C-SPAN, I forget which channel, 50, was it 56, right? It's different in different locations. I, I don't know what oh, it is in well, Austin. Yeah, in Austin it's 56, I think. But it's I'm sorry, the, uh, and, and by the way, I, what is that that you're going to be on on C-SPAN this afternoon? It's a, uh, a series that the C-SPAN is doing called Road to the White House. And they are already monitoring the uh, ca uh, presidential campaign of uh, several different uh, candidates. And the uh, episode that will be broadcast at 5.30 um, this afternoon is going to be, um, it was originally videotaped in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and it was a candidate forum between Gary Nolan, my opponent, and I, and that was uh, videotaped on June 9th, and uh, we did a, uh, a one-hour presentation. I was able to talk for uh, about 20 minutes, Gary spoke for 20 minutes, and then we did uh, approximately 20 minutes of uh, question and answer. Great. That ought to be really interesting. Yeah. Um, for those people in Austin who would like to learn a little bit more about me, I would like to direct them, first of all, to my website at badnarik.org. That's B-A-D-N-A-R-I-K dot O-R-G. And I would also like, them, like to invite them 
to the uh, Distinguished Speaker Series that is hosted by the Travis County Libertarian Party once a month. The third Sunday of every month, we hold a public meeting at the LCRA building at 3700 Lake Austin Boulevard, which is right across the street from the Hula Hut. And we have the, uh, the big conference room there, and we make, uh, once a month, we have people uh, from various places come in to give uh, speeches. And on July 20th, which is the third Sunday of this month, I will be making a three-hour presentation on my introduction to the Constitution. I've uh, personally written an eight-hour class on the Constitution, and this is a three-hour modified version of it that is uh, free to the general public. And uh, anyone who would like to attend is uh, asked to uh, call and uh, register, and the uh, uh, phone number that you would call would be 413-5928. Again, that number is 413-5928 if you would like to register to attend my introduction to the Constitution at, on July 20th of this month. Great. And uh, remind me, if I forget, and we'll make sure to mention that one more time before <clears throat> the end of the show, because it is free to get in. You said that was the 21st, correct? No, that's the 20th, oh, July 20th. 20th, which is the third Sunday. Okay. I'll be mine. All right, so... We touched on foreign policy a little bit there before the borders, which I guess that's sort of foreign policy, but <clears throat> the, uh, the international organizations, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, the World Trade Organization, should we get out of all of those? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I uh, startled an audience recently when they were asking me about the United Nations, and I indicated that if I am elected the president, I would give the people in the United Nations building one week to remove their files, to remove their computers, to get all their paperwork out. And at noon on the seventh day, I would personally push the plunger and blow that building up. Yes! Now, the... Uh, I'm sorry, you, can... you got my vote, Mr. President. I can't hold it back no more. Um, you know, I've been told over and over again that it would be more practical to get everybody out and to use the building for some other purpose. And while I admit that's true, using the building for another purpose doesn't nearly send a loud enough message. By destroying that building and videotaping it as it collapses on itself, uh, very similar to you know the World Trade Center, we would send a message to the socialists and communists around the world that the United States is dedicated to the Constitution, we are dedicated to the idea of individual rights and individual property, and that socialism does not have a home here on American soil. All right, now I've got to give you a chance here to differentiate yourself between you know, your position and the Republicans right now, because anybody turns to the Fox News channel any given day, they're bad-mouthing the U.N. all day, too. Are they bad-mouthing it for a different reason than you? Um, you know, I really don't spend that much time listening to the Democrats and Republicans. They've had, uh, you know, several, several decades to uh, get things right, and they don't. Um, the Republicans think that the uh, Second Amendment is, you know, sacred and that there should be limitations on the First Amendment. The Democrats think the First Amendment is sacred, and there should be limitations on the Second Amendment. And I just don't waste my time with them anymore. You know, they've lied to us. They've created the Federal Reserve Bank, which has all but destroyed our economy and, uh, you know, our, our worldview. And so um, it, it's time for something else. So I, I, to be honest, I just really don't pay that much attention to what the other parties are saying. Okay, well, let me set this up for you, because right now what's happening is the Republicans and the most of the right wing is mad at the United Nations because it was 
basically dragging ass on our war and standing in the way of us having this interventionist foreign policy. It's not interventionist enough. And so they want to go above and beyond it, and that's why they're bad-mouthing it. And I, there's a lot of people around the world who, if George Bush were to get us out of the United Nations right now, they would see that as the utmost emergency, which I would presume that if you were getting out of the U.N. the same day that, or getting our country out of the U.N. and blowing up their building the same day that you're bringing all our troops home and promising the world that this isn't to get a to get the UN out of our way so that we can kill you. This is to get rid of the UN so that we don't have any more Security Council resolutions to enforce against you by killing you. Absolutely. And there's Absolutely. a big difference there and I think that one you really gotta you really gotta make that one because there's a big part of the right wing now and you know the John Birch Society, they've hated the UN all along and they don't hate it for getting in the way of our war. They hate it because it's the cause of all of our wars. And, um, right. But everybody to the left of them and to the right of Al Gore, basically, is against it because it stood in the way of the war against Iraq, or tried to. Well, your, your assessment sounds very accurate to me, and, uh, and yes, I would uh, basically get us out of the United Nations in a very dramatic way. And that goes for the WTO and the IMF and the rest of it? Yes. Absolutely, which I, I view are just uh, different branches of the same monster. Okay, now you brought up the economy and the Federal Reserve Bank. Should I ask you a specific question, or should I just let you go? <laughs> well, it's up to you. It's your show. If you want, if you have a specific question, go ahead and ask. Otherwise, I can... Uh, okay, let's see if I can come up with a good one. Bob Woodward wrote a book about Greenspan called The Maestro. You got a problem with that? Um... I don't have any problem with people exercising their freedom of speech. I didn't read the book. Oh, I just so mean, I do you have what... a problem with the title, The Maestro, to, des to describe Greenspan? I wasn't saying, would you advocate banning the book or anything like that? But... Well, I, I think that it's a uh, an accurate uh, title because Alan Greenspan currently has more power than any American president has ever dreamed of. Alan Greenspan gets up in the morning and he can jockey the world market up and down with his little joystick. Alan Greenspan wakes up in the morning and sneezes, and the Japanese stock market drops 20 points. I don't think any individual should have that much power. And certainly, he does not have that power under the authority of the Constitution. For example, if you become a police officer, you only do that because you have successfully... Um, gone through the police academy and the community has given you the responsibility to wear a badge, wear a gun, and direct traffic. Now, can I come along and say, hey, gosh, could you loan me your gun? I'll go out and direct traffic for you while you go to lunch. Can I take that responsibility from you? Or can you give me that responsibility? Can I don't you think give so. me your gun and let me go out and write traffic to you? Of course not. Of course not. Because when the community gives the police officer that responsibility, does not give the police officer the authority to transfer that responsibility. So, now that we look at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 of the Constitution, which says that Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Nothing in the Constitution gives Congress the authority transfer that authority to someone else, to any other entity. So, in 1913, when Congress pretended to pass the Federal Reserve Act, they violated the Constitution. The Federal Reserve has is, first of all, not federal. It is not part of the United States government, any more than Federal Express is part of the post office. Just because it has the word federal in the name does not make it a government entity, although that was the reason that they chose the name, is because they understood that people would make that, you know, incorrect assumption. So the well, it wouldn't be any it wouldn't be any better if it was just under the Treasury Department, would it? Um, yes, it would, because the um, well, the Treasury Department basically is responsible to the people. The Federal Reserve Bank is not. 
And the biggest problem with the Federal Reserve is that 20 years after their existence in 1913, it took, uh, took the U.S. currency off of the gold standard, which allows them to inflate the currency. Now, personally, I don't care if it's a silver standard or a gold standard or some other standard, but the important thing about money is that it should not be inflated. Whenever the Federal Reserve prints money, they print money out of thin air. Every time they print money, the money that you already have in your wallet becomes worth less. Is and that why the dollar is falling on the foreign exchange markets right now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Our economy is in complete and total disarray because American money is worthless. One of the reasons, or one of the suggested reasons, for this war in Iraq in the first place is that Saddam Hussein and the rest of the OPEC countries were planning to change their oil industry from being based on the American dollar to being based on the euro. And the only thing that had been propping up the value of the American dollar is the fact that it was, you know, the, uh, the g generic currency of the oil-producing countries. And so if Saddam Hussein were to take the oil pr uh, production and move it to the uh, euro, then uh, the American currency would collapse and we would have a much bigger economic problem in the United States than we already have right now. And so when our soldiers took over Iraq, one of the first things they did was to take over the uh, production and um, contractual obligations related to that to make sure that they stay in a uh, based on the U.S. dollar. So, well, I hadn't even heard that. Where did you read that in the Financial Times? I, I confess I don't even remember. Because that hasn't I really been that. part of the debate. I haven't heard very much. I, in fact, I think that's probably the first I've heard of OPEC yeah. was about to start being based on the euro before this invasion. Well, um, I don't know necessarily that it's true, but it certainly sounds plausible to me. And whether that is true or not, I strongly suspect, I sincerely believe that our economic problems are just starting. You know, everybody keeps talking about, well, the economy is turning around and the stock market went up 200 points, yada, yada, yada. But um, you cannot get blood out of a turnip. And like all of the dot-com companies that were, you know, making all these wonderful promises and, you know, they're making profits based on we in the software industry known as vaporware. You know, it's, it's software you haven't written yet. And most of the American economy right now is based on products and services that have yet to be produced. And our debt and, is $6.4 trillion, right? Yes. And that debt is to the Federal Reserve. So, anyway, the, the Federal Reserve is, um, is not protecting us from economic crisis. They are literally creating the economic crisis. And the Federal Reserve is completely, totally unconstitutional. And I would uh, basically declare the Federal Reserve Act null and void and require the Treasury, which to the best of my knowledge is under the executive branch, to begin printing money, probably based on uh, silver standards. Um, I am not an economic expert. I've been told that gold or silver are not, you know, there are problems with gold and silver as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to, have to bring in an economic advisor, somebody that believes in pure Austrian economics, to explain what we need to do in order to get the United States out of this, uh, you know, economic uh, state that it's in. Now, one of the things that I would do would be to eliminate 
the IRS. Again, I could write an executive order telling everybody that works for the IRS to show up at work, pour themselves a cup of coffee, and start working on your resume. And basically, by not collecting taxes, in a, uh, income taxes from anybody, everybody in the United States would almost automatically get a 35% increase in their pay. That would allow them to pay off some of their bills, uh, buy a little bit more for their uh, kids, and that act all by itself should stimulate the economy to get us pointed in the right direction. Um, I don't pretend that that would be the only thing that would be necessary, but uh, I think it would be a good first step. Does it matter, when you talk about the constitutionality of the Federal Reserve Act, does it matter that Alexander Hamilton and George Washington set up the central bank in the very first Washington administration, that they decided it was as constitutional as could be, and that was in the 1790s? Well, just because they were founding fathers didn't mean that they upheld the Constitution, you know, properly. Um, uh, John Adams was the president, and he uh, was in office when they created the Alien and Sedition Act, which made it illegal anyone in the United States to speak poorly about the government. And one of the first things that uh, Thomas Jefferson did once he got into office was to eliminate the Alien and Sedition Act, noting that you could not have the Alien and Sedition Act and the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech, at the same time. So, you know, I do not allow other people to make my decisions for me, even if they were Alexander Hamilton. Well, especially Alexander, Hamilton, Alexander was, Hamilton. Well, yeah. And the point is that people don't know very much about who he is. They may be aware that he's on the $10 bill, but other than that, people don't know about Alexander Hamilton. They don't know about our American history. They don't know about the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. And when you are ignorant of that information, it's difficult, if not impossible, to make decisions about what the government should and should not be doing. And that is precisely why I developed my eight-hour class on the Constitution, and I go around teaching people what the Constitution actually says. You know, surprise, surprise, I give you a copy of the Constitution, and I say, open up to page 22 and read such and such a clause, and people will read that and then look at me and go, well, Congress can't do that. And I laugh and I say, what are you, some kind of constitutional expert or something? And the answer is yes. We the people ordain and establish the Constitution. And it's we easy to read. Have... It's not like it's written it's... originally in Aramaic or anything. I know. I know. We the people have rights. We give government privileges. And we can take those privileges away any time we want. And once you understand the fundamental basis for the Constitution, it is fairly simple to read the Constitution and understand what the Founding Fathers intended it to mean. Well, what would be the constitutional response to September 11th? Well, the constitutional response would have been to avoid it in the first place by not provoking countries to do that. However, now that it has been done, again, I don't have information that the uh, um, Secretary of the uh, Army has. And frankly, I want to point to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 of the Constitution, which allows Congress the power to declare war. It also allows Congress to issue letters of mark and reprisal. Now, what are letters of mark and reprisal? I think most of your listeners are probably familiar with James Bond, 007. And for those people that understand, double O in front of his you know, number indicates that he is licensed to kill. Well, where does a person go? license to kill. Is that just something that Hollywood dreamed up? No. If a government has the authority to go to war and stomp another country completely into the ground, doesn't it make sense that they also have the power and authority to do slightly less than all-out war? Are those the only choices we have is 
complete and total peace or war. And because they knocked down our buildings, I guess we're just going to have to go to war, you know, with 100,000 soldiers and just stomp, you know, stomp these uh, Middle Eastern countries out of existence. Well, that's not a requirement. We could issue letters of mark and reprisal, which are basically death warrants. You know, the government would put out a contract out on Osama bin Laden. He's the guy, presumably, who blew up our building. If Osama bin Laden blew up the World Trade Center, why are we now watching the news about Saddam Hussein? How did we go from Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan to Saddam Hussein in Iraq? Bloodlust. Did they, you know, did they switch teams or something? This is like watching the Super Bowl, and after halftime, you get a different team out on the field. You don't think people notice? You don't think the football pluck fans in the United States would be up in arms going, wait a minute, you can't do that. You switch teams in the middle of the game. Well, we do that with war, and nobody seems to know or care. Many of the American people believe that Saddam Hussein was directly involved in September 11th and that bin Laden works for him. Well, that may be true. I've never seen any evidence to that. I've never heard that idea brought up on television. Not even by the president or even Dick Cheney, who is his uh, appearances on Meet the Press is where we learn all these new lies for the first time, and he didn't even claim that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I would like your listeners to know that you can always tell when a politician is lying, and that is when their lips are moving. You know, your Democrats and Republicans have been lying to you for years. Hey, wait, doesn't doesn't that count for you too, then? I am not a politician. I am a citizen statesman. I am just one of your average, ordinary people, just a guy from Austin who is sick and tired of all the corruption in government. People ask me why I want to be President of the United States. And the answer is, I don't. I would much rather go to the airport and jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Because I'm straight up. I would much rather be drinking beer and chasing attractive women. But instead, I can't do that. They are violating my rights so badly that I feel compelled to run a campaign for President of the United States. Somebody needs to get up, get on television, and teach the American public the difference between rights and privileges, point to the Constitution, and say all of the members of Congress who voted in favor of the Patriot Act did so before it was even printed. And by doing that, they are guilty not only of gross negligence, but they are guilty of perjury. And the members of Congress who signed the Patriot Act should be sent to jail. Am I straddling the fence for anybody here? I think you've made yourself pretty clear. And in fact, I might add right here, when I interviewed Timothy Lynch, the Cato Institute's expert on the Patriot Act, he said that, yes, it is true that parts of the Patriot Act were not even written yet, and that they kept writing the bill after it had been signed and read by no one. How do you like that for unconstitutional? How many of your uh, listeners would be willing to send me a contribution to my campaign? And just leave the check blank. And I'll go ahead and fill in the check when it arrives. I don't, I don't think any of your listeners would make the contribution if they were going to allow me to fill in the amount after I get it. But that's exactly the principle that was involved when the Congress went ahead and passed and voted for the Patriot Act before it was even read. And I think that everybody should call their um, Congress representative and their senators and bitch and moan and say, listen, you lousy so-and-so, you know, you're violating my rights. You know, you're, you ought to go to jail. So, anyway, that is, that is my position. Um, I basically stand squarely on the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. I teach an eight-hour class on the Constitution. I would like to invite your listeners to attend my three-hour version 
at the LCRA building on July 20th, and they can do so for free. Uh, again, all they have to do is to um, uh, register, and uh, they can register by, oops, I got the... Uh, the phone number is 413-5928. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so call that number, register to attend on Sunday, and uh, they should also visit my website at bagnaric.org, B-A-D-N-A-R-I-K dot O-R-G, and uh, they should know that I am out lighting the fires of liberty one part at a time. Thank you so much for coming on the air today, sir. It's been a real privilege, and wish the best of luck to you. Thank you so much for having me.